All right, so tonight we are on um, lesson 11, and we're going to be covering First and Second Samuel. So we're going to be done around 9.30. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to go through a lot of stuff. And so for Daniel's sake, for everyone's sake, I just wrote the scripture, the majority of the scripture references on the screen. So you'll definitely want to just have your Bible open and follow along. There's tons of narrative. This is all narrative, um, both books. And so we will not be able to cover every story, of course, but hit some of the major things. Um, so we'll say right off the bat that First and Second Samuel in the Hebrew Bible is just one book, Samuel. And so for our English Bibles, we have two books, but, but it, it's best studied... Um, as a whole unit, and which we're going to be doing tonight, although in an hour. Um, and so we, there's some stuff that we will miss out on. But um, this book, so in the, so sorry if I might confuse some people tonight. Sometimes I'll probably say Samuel, and I'm referring to both. Sometimes I'll say First and Second Samuel. So just, we're going to all be confused probably when I say that. But just so you know, just prepare for that. Um, these Samuel, First and Second Samuel is a wealth of just, spiritual resource. Um, I mean, the life of David, I mean, has been a blessing to all for thousands of years. Um, this book is a go-to book for people in suffering and for people walking through things. I mean, it. this book, there, I mean, there are some great uh, insights and some great applications and just things for your soul. So that it's a rich resource for that purpose. Um, but it's also even more so um, an extremely important book of the Bible. If not, it could be one of the most important books um, in the whole of Scripture, First and Second Samuel. Um, so it is a wealth of resource also for how it contributes to the whole storyline of redemptive history. Um, so we're really going to be kind of hitting some of the main points of how this book, these books, attribute to the whole storyline of Scripture. Um, so why this, these books are so important is because it introduces David and the Davidic covenant. And, um, and from these books, we find that God is going to fulfill his promises, his promise that he first made to Adam, right? And then the promises he made to Abraham. But from this book, we're finding out that God is going to fulfill the promises he made to Abraham through David's offspring. So um, very important books. So think of redemptive history as a chain, a chain link, right? All of Scripture, of course, is those is the chain link of redemptive history. But if you could even get more specific with certain books or certain characters, um, First and Second Samuel is a very important link in the chain of redemptive history. Um, just a reminder: some basic points of um, redemptive history that you could really expound the, all all of Scripture on creation, fall, redemption, and um, respiration, it's the gospel. It's the, what the Bible is all about. It's God's plan of redemption of humanity. And we find here how God is going to accomplish that. We're putting the pieces together. Um, so after the fall, God makes a promise to Adam and Eve that through their offspring would come a male who would crush the head of the serpent. We discussed in previous lessons um, that that meant that one of their male children would reverse the curse of sin and bring redemp redemption and restoration of humanity, bringing them back into fellowship with God. Restoration. Um, we discussed that how God makes promises to Abraham and said that in his offspring all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God promised Abraham offspring. Right. We talked about how that has both plural and singular um, meanings to it that in an in a immediate sense that was a promise of the nation of Israel but in a singular more ultimate sense it was a promise of Christ um, and then he promised Abraham land the land of Israel and he also promised universal bl blessing and in Samuel we see that the offspring that is going to bring uni universal blessing and be the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham and to Adam and Eve is going to be a king from the offspring of David, and that he is going to rule forever. Um, okay, um, just moving on, we'll skip some of that. So I talked about some of the major links, thinking of 
the whole of the Bible, of course, is is the length of the links in the chain of redemption history. But you know, our the whole goal of this class is to not just to learn the scriptures, right? We want that, but we also want to be able to make disciples. We want to be able to sit down with new believers or how, whoever, however long they've been following the Lord, and really help them to um, read the Bibles for themselves. I mean, there's no easy way of making mature disciples of Jesus. You know, you can't make someone a person of the Word, but what you can do is give them tools to help understand it better. Um, and so this is just an easy way of thinking about um, some of the major characters. If we could even just think about the major characters of the Bible and how they contribute to the whole of the story, we could come up with some easy ways of, of really understanding the Bible's message as a whole. So some major links in the chain of redemptive history is Adam, God's Adam's promise to Savior, right? Um, Abraham's promised an offspring who would be a blessing to the nations. It continues on through David's offspring, which is Jesus Christ, right? So it's essentially the Bible message as a whole right there. Um, so tonight we're really just going to talk about how these all these promises really just fit together. But if we could just think in basic ways, if we could just understand these characters and the, the promises that God made to them, we really can just get a gist of the whole storyline of Scripture and put together the pieces, the major links of the Scripture together, right? Um, anyway, so let's go ahead and begin uh, with Samuel chapter 1 through 3. Um, Hannah's prayer and God's promise. So a few weeks ago in our last study in the book of Judges, we talked about how up to this point in Scripture, right, so we're in the the former prophets at this point, so we've covered a handful of books of the Bible, and we've been reading the Bible, right, as Christians, so we know how it ends, and we know the rest of the story, but we could say up to this point and to the whole of Scripture, we see, we talked about how God uses the weak things of the world to shame the, the wise. Um, I have a question. It's an easy question, but hey. But up to this point in Scriptures, has God ever brought salvation to anyone in such a way that they could boast in their mo own might or in their own arm? No, not at all. God uses the weak things of the world to shame the wise. We've talked about how God promised a Savior who would be the offspring um, to the world through the patriarchs. Yet every single one of the patriarchs had a barren wife. Isn't that interesting? We looked at the weakness of Moses, the deliverances of the Exodus. Who, who, get, who won the battles of the Exodus? God did. What did Israel do? Sit there and watch. Yeah, yeah, you know, they, yeah, complained. Yes, they complained. Um, God was the one who brought the victories. When we look at the conquest of Canaan, who got the victories? Whose, whose glory received for the victory of Jericho? God, they walked around the place. They didn't do nothing. I mean, God gets the victory. I mean, these men are slaying giants, right? Who gets the victory of that? God. Then we looked at the victories of the judges. I mean, we look at Gideon and how weak in faith he was, but yet God made him mighty in war. I mean, all of the judges, God using a, a son of a prostitute, um, a left-handed man. I don't know what was so... Weird about that, but apparently back then that was weird, and so he wanted to put that in there of saying God used someone nobody else would, would think, you know, would use. I'm sorry if you're left-handed, no offense. Um, but the point is, is that all of these little acts of salvation, I mean, not little, big acts of salvation, not the, you know, that pointed to the ultimate act, God never operates in such a way that man could boast. So when we're thinking about, we're reading through Scripture, we're asking these questions. Who is God? How am I to relate to Him? How does God act? Right? God acts in such a ways that we are, that He gets the glory and that our boast is to be in Him and that we are in the position of hope and trusting in Him to fulfill His promise. Um, so God is the one who brings the victory. That's the way God moves in Scripture. Um, from beginning to end. And in, in Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, and 2 Samuel, 
we see God's methods have not changed at all. He continues to bring redemption to humanity through human weakness so that no man may boast, and he receives all praise and glory. So chapter 1 starts off uh, with a woman named Hannah who is barren. She is in great distress over her situation. She pours her soul out to God. She asks God to remember her in her affliction. And that if God would bless her with a son, she would devote him completely to the service of the Lord. God hears her prayer and gives her a son, Samuel. Samuel rises to be the last of the judges and functions as a judge slash ruler slash prophet of the people of Israel. And he will be the one to anoint Israel's first king and transition Israel from being ruled by judges to kings. So he becomes a very important figure, right? And so... Side note, this is the transition in Israel's history where they no longer are ruled by judges and prophets, but, but kingship and the monarchy is brought in. Um, but Hannah's, all that stuff is, is, is great, um, but Hannah's prayer in chapter 2 is really what I want to focus on tonight. Um, and Hannah's prayer in chapter 2 really functions as like a hermeneutical key to understanding the rest of the book. And you could even say the rest of the Bible, but specifically tonight, um, first and second Samuel, and what what can happen is was we're going to read this, and we'll be able to you read the the narrative um, through these lenses, and you'll see that every narrative given points back to this ultimate theme. Okay, so this is one of those places I don't have the scripture up um, that you want to turn to. Turn to First Samuel um, chapter two. We're going to read verses one through ten. Okay, um, and Hannah prayed and said, "My heart." This is after God had given her a child context there. Um, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not the arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. The Lord makes poor and the Lord and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So we find here the major themes of these two books, right? So we see in verses 1 through 9, we see a theme is that God opposes the proud and saves the humble that rely and hope in him. So we see that traced throughout the rest of these narratives. Um, Jim Hamilton says, The mighty, the handsome, the seemingly impressive people of the world, such as Penanth, Peninnah, Saul, Goliath, and Absalom are exposed as bankrupt, while the small, weak, and fertile, and unimpressive, such as Hannah, Samuel, Jonathan, and David, are exalted. In Samuel, the important distinctions between the worldly strong and the worldly weak are those who are weak in the world's eyes, um, rely on Yahweh, and repent of their sin, not who are impressive in worldly terms. So you'll see that. If you read this book through that lens, you'll see that theme repeated over and over and over. Um, also, I don't want to say more importantly, but we see in verse 10 that God is going to rule and judge the nations through his king, his Messiah. It's the first time that that phrase Messiah is used. And she's, she's filled with the Holy Spirit praising God and is prophesying God ruling the nations through his anointed king, the Messiah. Um, I mean, so think about redemptive history and the things that we've covered so far. I want to do just kind of a review of kind of these messianic prophecies that we've covered so far. We have in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
later on in Genesis, and your offspring will possess the gates of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's from the tribe of Judah. And then 49, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Already in Genesis, a king from Judah to rule the nations. Numbers, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Moab, Moab of, out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and bread down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. And then here we come back to, to Hannah's prayer. The adversaries of Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power, the horn of his anointed. Um, and then we, last week we talked about the dilemma in Judges. Right, so that's that messianic expectation up to this point. And we talked about in Judges, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was this dark, dark days in Israel's history. And one theme, a phrase repeated over and over, that the author is trying to really clue people in on to what their problem was. He says, and this is one of the last verses in Judges, that in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So we see these promises more and more from Genesis to Numbers to Samuel, we, we get a glimpse. Redemptive history is progressing more and more and more. Revelation is progressing. And what are we seeing? That the solution of the fall is going to be brought forth from a king from the tribe of Judah. And what we learn and what we're going to learn, it's going to be specifically one of David's sons. So, so the shadow of Christ, the promise of Christ is getting more fuller Right, more and more and more as history goes on. Um, but we'll talk more about that as we go on. All right, let's keep moving on. And then you see in First Samuel chapter eight, Israel's problem. What was their problem? Is they wanted a king, right? And this seems to be somewhat of a contradiction as to what we just established. Um, go with me to chapter eight, verse four through nine. Um, it says, um, I'll "Give you a moment to turn there." Um, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, do I have this one up there? Yes, I do. There you go. Behold, you are, this, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have reject, not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so that they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king shall rule over them. All right, so we think of a somewhat contradiction. I mean, we remember, and in, in even the Mosaic Law in Deuteronomy 17, there are these implications that there's going to be a king already when they were in Exodus, right? Um, and then there's these stipulations given for here's what a king is to be like. We talked about he must not be a foreigner. He must not acquire wealth, horses, and, and many wives for himself. And he's to have his own handwritten copy of the law that he meditates on day and night. So God gave qualifications for a king. And what were those qualifications? Is that he was to be an Israelite man who fears Yahweh, a man after God's own heart. Right? So but why was their request sinful and rebuked by God? That's the question. Um, I think to answer that, let's step back and, and, and think of Israel's commission. They were called to be a kingdom of priests. They were called to be holy. And we talked about in Leviticus, what does that mean? That it means that they were to be separate from the more nations unto God. That's essentially how Leviticus defines holiness, to be always, to be set apart unto the Lord. But if you look at their status up to this point and what God says about them, you see that that's 
um, at this point, they're not devoted to God at all, right? Um, what were they wor- What were they wanting? They were wanting to be like the nations. They were wanting a king that they could see. Um, it, it their desire. It's the, the desires were wrong. It wasn't the the it wasn't the desire for a king that was wrong. It was why they wanted a king. Their motive for that that was wrong. They wanted to be like the nations. They were not wanting a king after God's own heart. They were wanting a king after their own heart, a king like all the other nations, and so God gives them one. And so we even, as, as Samuel moves on, and we get into chapter 4, you see Israel's heart, right? They're wanting to go battle the Philistines, right? And they don't seek and inquire of God first. And then they go and they just grab the ark, right? And think of it as like this magic good luck charm, right? And they say, let's take it with us to battle. They don't say, let's inquire of God, right? Because what did the ark symbolize? That was that play, that the ark was put in the holiest of holies, right? Um, which symbolized God's presence and his covenant promises um, with his people on the earth, that God's reign on the earth, right? So it was essentially symbolizing the presence of God. And they're like, let's take it with us. It's our good luck charm. Surely we'll win, right? Um, and then what happens? They lose, right? And the Philistines capture the ark and then they put it in their, their own idol's temple. And then what happens? It's they come down, it's bowed down the next day, right? They come back and the, the, their idols, Dagon's head is chopped off, right? And then there's plagues and all this stuff going on. Like It's like, again, who's getting the boast here? Is Israel winning all those battles because they were awesome? No, Yahweh destroys the Philistines by themselves. And, and what do they do? They, they say, let's get this thing out of here, right? And they, they send it away, right? And it comes back to, to Israel. Um, but what we're seeing is like Israel is not after God, Right? They're not seeking him. They're wanting to be like the nations. They're no longer. They had a commission given to them by God, just like we have a commission. Their commission was, um, you are a kingdom of priests. They were to mediate the, the blessing and the presence of God to the surrounding nations. God had put them um, in, at the height of that civilization at the time. Um, and the land between were to get to any of the major continents you had to go through Israel to get to. I mean, God gave them everything. And what are they wanting to be? They're not wanting to be wholly devoted to Yahweh. They're wanting to be like the nations. And that was sinful. So they do get a man after their own heart. And we really see Israel's sin in the man that God actually gives them. So we see um, 1 Samuel 10 through thir- chapter 31, we, we get the, the reign of Saul. And, um, and we see, you know, this teaches us more about why their motive was wrong. Because who does God give them? You know, what were his qualities? The author is very imp- goes out of his way to, to make it clear that, that he was handsome. He was tall. He was head, actually head and show a, a whole head's length, taller than everyone in the land of Israel. And he was handsome. I mean, I hear this in every, every you know, four years. You say, does he look presidential? Does he look presidential? And just bless their hearts. But the guys who are ugly, no matter how great they're, they're you know, how smart they are, People are just not going to want to vote for him because they want somebody who who wants who looks the part, who's presidential, you know. Um, and and this is kind of their motives there. Oh, he looks the part. They have their champions, right? Um, we want ours. We want somebody who will go out for us and rule over us and judge for us. Um, and so we see by the man that Israel gave uh, is that their desires were carnal, right? And then going back to Israel's. Or to Hannah's prayer, what do we see? Like, God does not, it's not, God's not looking on the outside things. It's not by might or one's wisdom that he prevails. They were wanting the opposite. Um, so Saul is appointed in these chapters. He's appointed as king, tragically fails. He starts off somewhat promising, but then he utterly fails and shows he doesn't, sh- he doesn't fear God from his heart. He is not a man after God's own heart. He is not a man of the Torah. Um, Saul is eventually rejected by, as, by God as king over Israel. God removes his anointing. There's actually a part in the story where once David is anointed, right, God, you know, Saul essentially apostatizes and the Holy Spirit is removed from him. And a demon has come to torment him. Right? And David's filled with the Holy Spirit from then on out. Right, and then you see David later on in his life. What he falls, he gets into sin, he commits murder, does these terrible things, and then Psalms fifty-one, what's he say? Take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's not wanting to happen what happened to Saul happened to him. Again, this is the old, this is not New Testament conversion or even Old Testament <laughs> conversion at this point. This is God's anointing of the Holy. I mean, think about the judges and how the Spirit of God came upon them to lead and to conquer. This is what we're talking about. Um, so Saul, um, Saul is rejected by God and fails. Um, but God is so gracious to Israel. He then anoints a king after his own heart, David. Okay, and then we see 1 Samuel 16, um, David is anointed as king. All right, and so Samuel goes to the house of Jesse. Um, remember, he's the, I think, the, the great, great, great grandson of Ruth, the time of Judges. So he's an important character here. Um, and even godly Samuel doesn't get it. Right, he's he, you know, he Jesse puts out all of his sons, and he's like, oh, here's one. He's he's got the look, you know, he's got the size, and God's like, no, don't look, make God, I don't, I don't see the way you see. I look at the heart, right? And he goes through each one, and he's like, God told me it would be one of your sons. Is the are these all your sons? And and Jesse doesn't even have, he he doesn't even br- bring David, right? David's still out in the pasture. He's like, Where, do you not have any more children? He's like, well, there, I do have one. Let me go get the, the runt of the litter, David, the youngest. Um, and again, this goes back to the theme of the whole book. Right? God is not by might. You know, those who hope in the Lord. Um, God, then anno- uh, Sa- God then has Samuel anoint David to be the future king over Israel. And then we go back to Hannah's prayer again, that God saving through the anointed king. Okay? And then what happens in David's life is amazing. Um, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David, and we mentioned that it's removed from Saul. He then becomes tormented with an evil spirit, and David is sent to, to, in his presence to play his music. And when David plays, the evil spirit, I guess, leaves Saul, and Saul can find peace. Who does that remind you of? When Christ would come as the son of David, and demons would flee from his presence. We really don't see anybody having that type of authority and power over the evil and then when Christ comes, it's just it's amazing. Um, and then um, one of the most epic stories in the whole Bible is given: David and Goliath. We got to talk about this one. Um, uh, and so after after David is anointed, um, after David is anointed, Saul and the armies of Israel go out to war against the Philistines. Um, David goes back to the pastures. Um, at some point in this time, he has become like a half armor bearer for Saul, and then also still part-time shepherd. Um, So he's out in the field. Jesse, his father, sends David on his way to the battlefront to see how his brothers are doing and brings them some food and says, bring back word that they're okay. Um, And when he arrives, he sees that there is a champion of the Philistines who for 40 days has had Israel cowering on the sidelines, terrified to challenge him. He has been cursing Israel and Israel's God. Remember what God said to Abraham? I will curse those who curse you. It's a huge part of this puzzle. What's, what's, what's um, the Philistine doing? He is cursing them, cursing their God, cursing them up and down for 40 days. And Israel, the Israelites are terrified. Um, and he's daring them, saying, hey, one-on-one, you win, we're your servants. I win, you're, you're our servants. Um, and then Goliath is, 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 is the man, and he was a monster of, of a man, nine foot nine. He wore a coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds, right? And those were the, I don't know, I guess the metal shirt you kind of wear under your armor. Um, you, you know, so this is not talking about his, all of his other armor he's wearing. 125 pounds, you know. There are some ninth graders out here in high school who can't even bench that, <laughs> right? And <laughs> you have this beast of a man running. I mean, and he's, this is hand-to-hand combat, and um, you need to be fast. The tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. I mean, how many women do you see pumping those 15-pound dumbbells, 10 pounds, 8 pounds? Right? I mean, this is the tip of the man's spear. Um, and he had been a warrior from his youth, right? David's, they say, you're a youth. He's been killing people since he was a youth, right? Um, so Goliath has everyone cowering and afraid, and even Saul. What did we establish about Saul? He was a head above 
everyone. So is, Israel had their champion, and what is he doing? He's cowering, saying, hey, yeah, and anybody, I'll give them my daughter if they'll go in, you know, in marriage, if they'll go fight him, right? Um, so Saul is on the sidelines with everyone else. Um, before we reread this story, I just kind of want to make a couple points. Um, you know, again, I'm mentioning it over and over. You know, the theme of the book is God opposing the proud, giving grace to the humble. Salvation is of the Lord and God ruling the, the, the nations through his anointed king. Right. And so if we really want to understand this story rightly, there are a lot of ways that we can, a lot of applications that we can bring and that this, this story is taught. And it's out of its redemptive historical context, right? So, so let's try to read it through the redemptive historical con- context first. You know, remember, what is God ultimately doing? He's going to send a deliverer who would crush the head of the serpent. And he's going to do it through his anointed king who trusts in the Lord, right? Um, so with all that being said, um, you know, let's, let's read it um, through that lens. And... Um, We'll stop when we need to, but let's go to First Samuel 17. Let's start at verse 24. Um, we got time, so I don't. Yeah, this is important. So, First Samuel 17:24. Let's start there. It says, "All the men of Israel, when they saw the, the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and he will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So no taxes and a king's daughter. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for this man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, Show what shall be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his, oldest, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Those few sheep. David's just this, this, these few little sheep he's taken care of. Very humble. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come up to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep from his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him, and I struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and of the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul, clo- then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for there he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will deliver your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day 
to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give, he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came near to David, David ran quickly toward the battle line and met the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and he took a stone and slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling with a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. All right. Yeah. So much that we could say about this story, but I just want to point out a couple things. Um, number one, God is the hero of the story, not David. Um, so these sayings of David, David gives these series of speeches. He gives it to the people, the, to the warriors. He gives a speech to Saul, and he gives a speech to, um, to Goliath. And in each speech, he is... He is, um, he is saying that it's not, I'm coming after you. He's saying, you have defied God. God is going to deliver me, right? So the story of David and Goliath is about God delivering and saving his people. So um, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Or you defied the Lord. The Lord will give me victory, right? Saul will even say, the Lord be with you, right? Um, so this text is about God as Savior, um, number two, this text is ultimately about God's ruling and saving work of his Messiah, Jesus Christ, to which David only pointed. Right? What was the Savior to do? He was to crush the head of the serpent, the enemies of God. Right? This is a foreshadowing of the ultimate skull crushing that Christ would do. Right? So, um, in this passage, David had just been anointed. This is what's so cool. He had just been anointed shepherd of Israel. Then he comes to Goliath with shepherd gear, right? And his first duty as shepherd over the people of God is to slay their enemies, and he does it, right? And he chops off his head. And that's exactly what the greater shepherd, the son of David, has done. Is he, in what looked like weakness, to coming as leaving heaven, becoming um, a man, and living a humble life in the weakness of death and of the cross, he slayed the serpent in his triumph with his death and with his resurrection. So this story is ultimately about Christ. So when you read this story, you're not David, right? You're not Goliath. You're on the sidelines with everyone else, going, man. He's scary. We, you know, and we cannot. We're going to die unless someone else comes, right? So this this text is about Jesus. You're facing an enemy who you cannot defeat. You need a savior to come and save you and give you the victory. And the good news of the gospel is that the savior has come and brought victory, and your job is to repent and believe upon him. So this text is a foreshadowing of what God is going to do through His anointed King, who's going to crush the enemies of of the forehead of Moab, like Numbers says. It's going to crush the head of the serpents. Um, briefly, um, other ways that, you know, we don't have time to really cover it. So other ways David typifies and foreshadows Christ. You should really read both of these books, just seeing the foreshadowings of the life of Christ and the life of David. There are so many to talk about. So David's anointed king over the people. He defeats their enemies, gives them rest, brings the ark, the presence of God, into a permanent residence in Jerusalem. The same way Jesus um, is greater than, Jesus is the anointed king of God, defeated all of God's, all of our enemies, Satan, sin, and death, and brings us into peace and rest forever through his rule. And we have fellowship with God in his presence forever. Um, and many, many other ways um, through the life of David. You read it through the, that lens, looking for Christ, and you'll see a lot of, a lot of similarities. Um, moving on with time. Let's talk about 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 16, the Davidic covenant. This is one of the, 
if not one of the most important verses in all of the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Um, so let's, we, we want to understand this. If we want to understand redemptive history, we need to understand this. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. Um, yeah, we got time. This, again, a lot of scripture, but this is important part of scripture. Now, when the king lived in his house, the Lord had given him rest from all of his surrounding enemies. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this, to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling in all places where I've moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you may be a prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all of your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly for the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, you will lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you. And, he shall, and who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But with my steadfast love, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is a pinnacle point in the whole Bible. This is a major link in the chain of redemptive history. Right? So what's happening? Two things are, well, more than two things, but we could, we'll just say two things. Um, number one, um, God is extending the promise made to David, or excuse me, the promise made to Abraham through the line of David. That's what God's doing here. Um, about this, Jason DeRossi, he'll, he'll say, um, and, 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 and let's talk about, you know, when you really read together these the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant, you see a lot of similarities, a lot of the same things being said. Um, so how does the promise made to Abraham, how are they going to be channeled through David's offspring? Jason DeRossi has a very helpful quote. He said, God is going to make for David a great name, give his people a land and plant them in it, Put an end to Israel's oppressors by cursing them. Make a dynasty and establish a kingdom. So God is extending his promises he made to Abraham are going to be fulfilled in David's offspring. Um, secondly, um, God is making it clear in this passage that the Messiah is going to be a son of David who is going to rule forever. Rule forever. So these are some massive Massive promises God is making here. I mean, just like the massive promises he was making to Abraham, he's making some massive promises here. Um, and I just want to say something about that. You know, in the Old Testament specifically, um, when we see these these promises that God makes, we need to be think of them in two ways. We need to realize that, that um, they have an immediate fulfillment and then an ultimate fulfillment, long-term fulfillment. We see that happening here. We could just have read that and say, oh, Solomon, yeah, that's Solomon's going to build a temple, right? Um, but then, as we also, there's a long-term ultimate fulfillment that God's ultimately talking about, Christ. So think of that when you're thinking about some of these Old Testament promises. Um, so these are huge promises, and up to this point, God had given David rest and victory. Now David wanted to build a house for God, a permanent place um, for God in his kingdom, a temple, God said, nope, not from you, from your son. Um, but what I'm going to do for you, he has a play on words. He says, you want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house. 
And in the original language, he's talking about a dynasty. It's a play on word, words. So he's promising David, David a dynasty that will last forever. So we could think, okay, well, maybe his son will be a king and he'll die and then another son will come. Maybe God's promising it like that. Not likely. Not likely. Because then what happens later on in Israel's history? You know, Solomon comes on the scene and then things are booming and it's awesome, but Solomon then sins. And then the kingdom is divided. Not to have rest. It has division. They're exiled from the land. Slaves to other people. Then even the remnant that comes never really has a king from the tribe of Judah ruling. Even all the way up to Jesus' time, who's ruling them? The Romans. Right? But what did God do is he faithfully preserved that line of Judah. Right? And so we're seeing that, man, this isn't talking about just Solomon. It's talking about someone greater than Solomon whose kingdom. I mean, this is just amazing. Just the words forever. And when we think about the messianic promises up to this point, a ruler from the tribe of Judah, a skull crusher, God's anointed king who would rule the nations. Um, and then one thing that I did not mention that I will mention is, what's, what, is what is said in 1 Samuel 2.35. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go out in and out before my anointed forever. So God is making these massive promises in these books. He's saying, David, you're going to have a son who's going to rule the nations forever. And this king is going to have a priest who's going to be a priest after my own heart. is going to rule with him forever. And then what we're going to see is that these promises are way more magnificent than we think. Um, as Revelation goes on, we see, well, these, these promises are culminated in Jesus, who is the priest king, right? Who is the great high priest and the king. Um, and that is really good news. So it's not a succession of kings and, and priests that live on and then they die. But what is, what is Hebrew tells us? That Jesus is at the right hand of God forever. And he's God's anointed who rules forever. Now we don't see that as a reality, but one day we will. Um, let's keep on moving on. We're almost done here. Um, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, this is a tragic story of David's fall. Um, so is, is David the guy, though? Is he the anointed king that Hannah was talking about who's going to rule the nations? And you know, when you read 1 Samuel, right, you start thinking maybe this is it. Maybe he's that guy that was prophesied about in Numbers. Well, no, he's from Judah. He's crushing. I mean, he's winning. I mean, Saul won his thousands. David won his tens of thousands, right? Killed Goliath. You think, surely he's the guy. Right? Um, and at the point, you could really begin to wonder, is David the promised ruler? Um, and then, especially when you get to his son, Solomon, the rest, the temple, that some scholars have estimated that was probably trillions of dollars of gold. I mean, and, and you, and the universal blessing. I mean, you have kings and queens coming from all over the world to hear his wisdom. You think, wow, universal blessing? Rest? The temple, this is it, right? No, then Solomon turns away from the Lord, right? Um, so 2 Samuel 11 is, is given to us to be like, no, David's not the guy. We need someone greater than David. Um, at the beginning of our studies, we talked about how the Bible is about God, the kingdom of God, and we're getting to the point where we're seeing God's going to rule over his people through his anointed king forever, in, um, in his kingdom, but the Bible is ultimately about the kingdom of God. Um, we talked about the kingdom pattern, but we're now at this point in the kingdom foreshadowed. Right? The kingdom was promised to Abraham. The kingdom was foreshadowed in David and Solomon. And why is it called the foreshadowed kingdom? It's because of what we were just saying. There are points in their rules and their reigns where you're like, this may be the guy that really foreshadows the eternal rule of Jesus. Um, but 2 Samuel 11 tells us this tragic story of David and Bathsheba. He's not. We need someone greater than David. We need someone who's not affected by sin. David tragically sins, and then really the rest of 2 Samuel till the end of the book is, is David's. I mean, he, his sin with Bathsheba was not the only thing. I mean, you have the census, right? But the good news is, is that um, David's sin was not God's final word. Right? God disciplines his children, but he, 
God covered David's sin. He disciplined him. Um, but God was still with David. And the second Samuel ends, and he dies as an old man, recounting the faithfulness of God. Um, but it teaches us that sin's not the last word. God's faithful to his promise. He will raise up a son of David. Um, but it won't be Solomon. It won't be Solomon's sons. Right? We'll see, the, as I said earlier, the kingdom's going to get divided. They're going to go into exile. And there will be no king. Right? Um, and then a new era comes, and Matthew opens up his, test, his New Testament saying, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So again, we have the, 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 ch- the links in the, the chain. Adam promised an offspring. A- Abraham's promised an offspring. David's promised an offspring. And Christ is the fulfillment of the offspring. So we see um, that all of the Old Testament promises find their fulfillment in Jesus. And that these are the main promises and the covenants God made promising that find their fulfillment in Jesus. And what does this teach us? That the whole the, the Bible is the whole Bible is ultimately about Jesus. And we see this flushed out in the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. Um, anyway, so I'll just close with this. Um, so much can be said, and I did mention earlier that you should, in your own free time, read the life of David through the lens of seeing him as a type that pointed to something greater. I mean, you'll see wonderful things. You'll see a man who was forsaken by those closest to him, a man who had no place to, to, to lay his head. I mean, so many of these things, they're, they're, they're great. But there's also another way, to, another lens that you need to also read it through, is there, there is a first and second Samuel and the Psalms are just some beautiful resources of just, um, and just that are so encouraging, le- lessons that you can learn from a man of God. And that's how I just want to kind of close, just kind of talk about some, some pastoral applications from the life of David. You could find hundreds probably, but I just want to share a couple. Um, number one, David's rise to kingship teaches us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You think you feel weak, you feel insufficient as a parent, so whatever. That's not your disqualification. That's your qualification to be used by the Lord. Um, two, David's life teaches us that we must walk by faith and not by sight. The first half of David's life is this whole thing. He's anointed king, but then he is running for his life for years after that. You're right? And it's like, where is the promise, Lord? Right? And so his whole life is a life of, you know, walking by faith and not by sight. Uh, number three, suffering and hardship are graces that keep us clinging to God. During this whole s- season of David's life, we find some of the richest psalms in the whole psalms, right? Um, four, based upon that, God uses our suffering to bless and to minister to his people. I'm sure David did not know the, the amount of ways God was going to use his sufferings to bless the people of God, right? And that's just the pattern of the scripture. We go through things and... God then uses that in our life to be able to minister and bless others. We learn that from the life of David. Um, number five, um, God prepared David for his ministry first in the pasture. He didn't go fight Goliath first. What does he say? No, God had delivered me from the hand, of the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be delivered into my hand. Like God, God prepared him and trained him to get him to those points. Um, and just I just want to point that out um, and, just, and just say, you know, God taught him how to fight and to trust him in the pasture first. Being a sh- these small little, you know, his brother said, those few sheep, go back to those few sheep, right? But this teaches us to not, nickel, not think lightly of God's providence in our life. You know, you just don't know the things that God's teaching you that will be so important for your future. So don't think of it lightly that it's the day of small things, right? David had a day of small things or any, even just thinking about the trials that you've gone through or are going through where God, what's he doing? He's teaching you how to fight. He's teaching you, he's growing you, he's maturing you, right? So we don't want to neglect the, the day of small things that God has his way of knowing for us how to, to mature us, how to shepherd us well. And we need to submit to his providence and trust him. And let the things that God brings us train us into maturity. 
um, because he knows how to bring us to greater maturity and usefulness. Um, David's life teaches us that great men can fall. The Psalter, who is known as the the psalmist of Israel, fell into great sin. Um, But number seven, David's failures also teach us that our sin is no match for God's grace. No matter what, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more for the life of David and for us in Christ. Um, number eight, David's life teaches us that the greatest gift we can possess is God himself. Right? We don't really, we could see that in his life, right? He had everything. He, he was the champion. It's like he was the, he was the athlete and the rock star and, and it all put together in one. But what is you, what do you see him in the Psalms? My soul thirsts for you, God. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore, right? So the greatest thing we can possess is God himself. David's life teaches us that. Um, And number nine, David's life and legacy teaches us that at the end of the day, all that matters is if we are men and women who are after God's own heart. When the New Testament talks about David, it's not talking about, is he even mentioned in the heroes of faith in the 11? I'm not sure. Chapters 11 of of, um, Hebrews, I'm not sure. It could be. I don't know. I don't think so. But when the New Testament talks about him, he's not, it's not talking about the slaying of Goliath. It's not talking about all of these things. The mighty king, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. Right? So the, the, the New Testament witness about David remembers him for the very thing of being a man after God's own heart. So the most important thing you could do in this life is to be a man or a woman who is after God's own heart. That's what David's life teaches us. Um, much more can be said. But we'll close there. Let's pray. Um, Father, um, I just want to pray um, just for everyone here in this room, Lord, who um, maybe finds themselves fighting the, the lion and the bear and um, or maybe in places in their life where they just feel like they're in a valley or they're in a, a season where they just don't know what's going on and um, I just pray that we would all be encouraged by David's life. That um, he says, this I know, that God is for me. In Psalms 56, Lord. I just pray that we would be encouraged by man who experienced the ups and downs and the sorrows and the blessings. Lord, um, really experienced everything that this life, all the different types of emotion that a person can go through. Lord, and he was a man after your own heart. And I just pray we'd be encouraged by his life and that we would be men and women after your own heart. Um, I pray we would be with, uh, that you would be with us the rest of the week and that you would strengthen us to go from here and to live for your glory and help us to always know the battle is the Lord's and whatever we're dealing with, whatever sin, whatever virtue we need, whatever it is, Lord, as John Mark reminded us, the Holy Spirit is there to help us. Lord, may we be more and more confident in you. In Jesus' name, amen.